It is a, a, a real personal pleasure to be able to introduce Leslie Aiello as our opening plenary speaker. Leslie and I began our careers together in 1976 at, at University College and we worked together for 20 years and we were, we were always very good, good friends from the moment we, we first met. Um, in 1996, I came to Manchester and Leslie became head of the UCL Anthropology Department and she then became head of the whole UCL Graduate School, which is pretty large and demanding task, until in 2005 she finally left London to uh, become president of the Wenner Grand Foundation. Now, it, it goes without saying that Wenner Grand Foundation presidents have always been exceptionally distinguished anthropologists in their own right. This is not just a bureaucratic job. You have to be a really good anthropologist to be president of the Wenner Grant. Uh, it's also from the point of view of IUS, which is of course a four-field anthropology organization, as David emphasized earlier, very convenient that Leslie is a biological anthropologist. She's author or co-author of almost 50 full-length scientific articles in books and journals, an author or editor of five books, one of which was a double special issue of the Journal of Human Evolution, on which she was subsequently a co-managing editor for six years. Leslie has made major contributions to evolutionary theory, the evolution of human adaptation, the evolution of the brain, locomotion, diet, language, and cognition. Her most recent studies have focused on thermoregulation and climate adaptation in Paleolithic hominids. She's been invited to give many, many distinguished lectures and received many awards, including our own uh, Royal Anthropological Institute's Huxley Memorial Medal. She will also, I would say, as a, another personal aside, gave the best inaugural lecture I've ever heard in my entire career, which I still treasure to this day. Now, obviously, because Leslie's going to talk about the Wenner Foundation in relation to the past, present, and future of anthropology, I shouldn't go down that road. I'll let, I'll let her her say everything she's going to say. But there is just one other little thing that I'd, I'd like to add as somebody who's had quite a long relationship with when a, when a Gren as a evaluating grant applications and, and participated in a lot of when a Gren supported activities over the years and under Leslie's own tenure. I mean, Leslie really has done wonderful work at when a Gren in terms of streamlining operations, improving grant application materials, and in particular in giving applicants absolutely wonderful feedback. I mean, I said earlier, I'd stress that Leslie's a biological anthropologist, but she's always struck me as a biological anthropologist who's grasped the whole field and all the subfields of anthropology is unusually acute. And she really does a wonderful job of dealing with what's a very demanding job. I mean, money is limited. Most applicants to the Wenner-Gren Foundation's programs will be disappointed. Uh, and she does a wonderful job of of communicating with, with everybody. Um, so she's done great work at the Wenner Grand, and she's doing a briefing meeting on Friday, August the 9th at 1 p.m. during the event. Anybody who wants to apply to the Wenner Grand Foundation really should attend that meeting because you'll get some really good practical advice on how to get, get money. And I've benefited once from a Wenner Grand Grand. It's well worth trying. But that, that's not all I have to say really about, about Leslie and the Wenner Grant. I mean, nobody has done more than Leslie in re, and the Wenner Grant in recent years to strengthen the world anthropologies movement. I mean, it's not just a matter of money, it's also a matter of, of a will to develop global anthropology, a more level playing field, a more inclusive world community of anthropologists. And, Leslie's vision of a global, inclusive, and plural anthropology, you know, has really been quite inspirational. That is, 
also a major theme of this Congress. You'll see that the final plenary that Susanna Narosky and Gustavo Lins Rivera have organized is on world anthropologies explicitly. So there, there's really nobody more qualified or appropriate than, than Leslie to give this opening address. So I'm looking forward very much to listening to what she has to say. Okay, well, I, just, I don't know if I can live up to that introduction, but I want to tell you how happy I am to be here and what a treat it was to be asked to give the inaugural opening lecture. Now, what I want to do in this is also give some of you who may not realize how unusual the Vennegren Foundation is a little bit of idea of its quirky history. And you'll understand in a minute why I say it's very quirky because uh, it was established on the basis of a fortuitous meeting between very uh, unusual uh, uh, individuals. And this meeting involved a tiger, but I'll get there uh, in a minute. Now, uh, as John said, the uh, title of my talk is The Vennegren Foundation, Past, Present, and Future of Anthropology. And I have to admit, I gave him the title because I wasn't quite sure what I was going to talk about. But uh, what uh, we uh, actually need to realize is the mission of the Vennegren Foundation is almost identical to that of the IUAES and the World uh, Council of Anthropological Associations. What we want to do is support international anthropology and networking of anthropologists. Now, as been previously said, uh, the Vennegren Foundation has supported almost every IUAS conference uh, since the uh, Second World War. And I just want to give you a flavor of one of the conferences that we were perhaps uh, most involved with. And this was in Chicago in 1973. And it involves a very unusual man named Soltax. Now, Soltax was the founding editor of the foundation's journal, Current Anthropology. But he was a real mover and shaker. I mean, he was a, in fact, he, he would probably even overshadow John in his organizational abilities. Uh, he convinced Mouton publishers to advance 200,000 US dollars to support that conference. Now, in today's money, that 200,000 was over a million US dollars. Now, how, how did he use this money? He had Pete Seeger and the Pete Seeger singers come and sing. He organized a huge American Indian powwow. He had a parallel conference for young people. He had teenagers from 17 countries come to this parallel uh, conference. And what perhaps surprised me most, he also commissioned an opera. Now, the fellow here is John Carlo Minotti. And he paid Giancarlo Minotti 20,000 US dollars to compose a new opera specifically for the conference. Now, it, it, in the text up there on the screen, the plot was a couple in Chicago, an urban couple. They see a picture of a family fleeing the bullets in war-torn in Indonesia. Uh, they give expressions of concern and detachment. The guy leaves for work. The doorbell rings, and suddenly the Indonesian family burst into the Chicago family. And the plot of the opera was the cultural conflicts and similarities and differences. Now, unfortunately, this uh, opera was a total flop at the meetings. Uh, you, 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 you see there uh, M M Margaret Mead sitting and talking with Soul Tax and the composer and two unidentified anthropological opera lovers. Uh, they, did, they were only able to sell about a third of the tickets. They lost over $100,000 on this production, which in today's money would be about uh, 700,000 US dollars. And Soul Tax, years later, thought that this was a fantastic success. Now, the result of the $200,000 cash advancement, it basically bankrupt Mouton publishers who four years later went bankrupt. Uh, the uh, sales of the books, Soltax had actually told Mouton that they would publish over 100 edited volumes from the conference. Uh, in the end, I think 92 volumes were published, but they didn't sell very well. 
And uh, this was the style of the IUAS under Soltax in 1973. Now, there actually is a connection between opera and the Venergrand Foundation. And this is through Marguerite Venergrand, who was an opera singer. And Marguerite Venergrand uh, met uh, uh, Alex Venergrand on a transatlantic crossing from New York to uh, Southampton. They apparently had a whirlwind chipboard romance. She was 18 years old. She was going to, to Europe to launch her opera career, fell in love with Alex Venergrand, and it must have been very hot and heavy because they got married as soon as the boat landed. Now, uh, where, where, where the money came from, comes from is vacuum cleaners because Axel Venergren had the, well, the, shall we say the light bulb would, went on that every woman would want a household vacuum cleaner. Uh, he developed uh, the vacuum cleaner. He was president of Electrolux moved from vacuum cleaners and uh, then into refrigerators. So he was really a household person. Now, uh, he, uh, at, at, at the point of, uh, say, the late, mid, late 1930s, he was worth about a billion US dollars. Again, in today's money, this would be about 16 to 17 billion. And I actually looked it up on the Forbes list, and he would have been about the 41st wealthiest man in the world today. Now, by the mid-1930s, he gave up active involvement with Electrolux. He bought this yacht, which is uh, called the Southern Cross. He bought it from Howard Hughes. And there's Howard Hughes sitting in the cockpit of his wooden airplane called the Spruce Goose. Now, uh, in the late 30s, uh, the Venegrens had a very luxurious life. Uh, they own Paradise Island, which is that uh, island in the Bahamas, and you see it there and behind the cruise ships. And they would sail between the Bahamas. Uh, they had uh, a beautiful estate outside of Cuernavaca in Mexico called Casa de Cortez. And they also owned Herringay Palace in Sweden. And uh, at the time in the 30s, this was the largest swimming pool in Sweden. And they used to have a slide from the second floor window that they could slide out of the house right into the swimming pool. Now, as you might imagine, Venergren had quite a big ego. And leading up to the Second World War, he thought that he could avoid the war by acting as a self-appointed emissary between Neville Chamberlain in the UK and Hermann Goring. Now, we all know that he wasn't very successful in this. But what he was successful with was getting himself blacklisted during the Second World War. Now, some of this may have to do with his association with the Duke and Duchess of Windsor in, in the Bahamas. He had also, uh, over decades, had had extensive business interests in Germany. But we've been doing some recent research on this, and we've actually found FBI papers that put his blacklisting down to the State Department in the US, being very concerned about his interests in Mexico and other parts of Latin America. In fact, uh, just before his blacklisting, he was financing an export board in Mexico, and the US was very worried about him getting control of too much interest in the country there. Now, uh, what happened is as soon as the Second World War ended, uh, his blacklisting w w was lifted. He was invited to the Truman inauguration in 1949. And very interestingly, he was given a fellowship at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. This was in 1960. And you may ask, why would they give him a fellowship at an Institute of Science? Of course, he'd been interested in vacuum cleaners and refrigerators. But he also was interested in transport and public transport. If any of you have been to Disneyland in Southern California, the monorail system there, if you look closely at the picture, it's the Disneyland Alwec monorail system. Alwec is an, ac an acronym for Axel Venergren. He wanted to sell this to the city of Los Angeles as a mass transit system. Unfortunately, the city council voted him down. Uh, but you can see the, uh, it's become a historic mechanical engineering landmark. So his genius in designing 
the, micro, um, the, the monorail has been recognized. Now, in the 50s also, he went in com to computers, and he d developed the all-WAC computer. This is also an acronym for Axel Wenner-Gren Accounting Computer. Uh, he was using a different system, of course, from uh, IBM, and he lost out to IBM. Now, the take-home message from this is during the 1950s, uh, and uh, leading into his death in 1961, he lost virtually his entire fortune. And this is an interesting story in itself, and we're trying to do uh, re research to actually determine what the sequence of events is. But he was one of the wealthiest men in the world in the 1930s. And by the late 1950s, he was virtually bankrupt. And his only legacies are his philanthropic activities, which of course is the Venner Grand Foundation for Anthropological Research. But also there's independent Venner Grand Foundations in Sweden. And this is the Venner Grand Center in Stockholm. The thing that looks like the cyclotron is 160 apartments for visiting international re researchers who want to do research either at the Karolinska Institute or the University of Stockholm. Now, you notice that I've mentioned nothing about anthropology. And Wenergren himself wasn't really interested in anthropology. And this is where the chance in the formation of the foundation comes it from. Because he happened to meet this fellow whose name was Paul Fehosh. Paul Fehosh was a Hungarian. And I normally describe him as Indiana Jones. And from what we can tell from his papers and people who knew him, he really had that type of a personality. Uh, during the First World War, he rode with the Hussars. He also flew with the First World War Air Cavalry. Uh, his parents uh, wanted him to do something respectable, and they insisted he go to medical school. So he went to medical school in Hungary. He became a medical doctor, but he never liked that. His true interest was in drama, the theater, and early film. And uh, when he came to the U US in the early 20s, and he rapidly uh, became a very well-known director. He was involved in silent film. He almost was the director of All Quiet on, on, on the Western Front. In fact, perhaps his most famous uh, film is Lonesome. And this was just put out last year by the Criterion Collection, which is a company that sort of reprocesses uh, classic old film. And th this just won an award for the best uh, uh, d d DVD uh, film release uh, last year. So we're all very, very proud of this. Now, uh, what happened was, he was in uh, Singapore uh, filming for a Swedish film company. He'd gone uh, from the commercial theater uh, into ethnographic work and documentary filmmaking. And he just happened to run into Axel and Marguerite, who were circumnavigating the, the globe in the Southern Cross. Totally fortuitous. Now, we have an urban myth about the formation of the foundation. And as I said, this has to do with the tiger. And what the urban myth is, that actually is in Axel Wenner-Gren's papers and also Paul Fehosh's papers, is that Wenner-Gren wanted to go on a tiger hunt. Fehosh was his man to organize the tiger hunt. The tiger charged, Wenner-Gren froze, and Fehosh shot it, and it ended up in two million US dollars in Electrolux stock for anthropology. Now, th this is a nice story. Unfortunately, it's not entirely true. And the person who blew the whistle on it was this gal. Her name is Jean Gautier. She was Marguerite Venegren's sister. She was a silent film star and apparently extremely successful. She uh, starred in 89 silent films, but she was more than just the pretty face. She actually wrote almost 50 screenplays. She was really quite an amazing woman. She walked away from it all in 1920 when she was age 35 and spent the rest of her life living with the Venner Grants. Now, she was on this uh, circumnavigating boat trip and kept a diary. And what she said that there was a cat involved, but the cat was in a cage. And uh, Fehosh was filming. 
the cat got out of the cage, the poor cat got shot, but no one was in any danger. Okay, now what we think happened was that Venegren and Fehosh actually bonded over a uh, common interest in Peru because Venegren had uh, business interests there. Fehosh was this adventurer, was interested in archeology. span In 1940, Fehosh convinced Venegren to fund a year-long expedition to the Machu Picchu region. And on that expedition, they actually located most of the sites on the Inca Trail. And in fact, uh, for a period of a year or two, this whole area around the Inca Trail was called the Venergren National Park. Uh, Venergren also uh, provided money to establish the archaeology department at the University of Cusco. Now, uh, Venergren didn't stay for the whole year. When he left, uh, Fehosh went into the Amazon. He spent about oh, four to five months uh, li living with the Yagi in the Amazon. And his ethnography of uh, his experience there is the first issue of the Viking Fund Publications in Anthropology. Came out in 1943. And the Viking Fund uh, ran from that time all the way up to the late 1970s. And for that period, particularly the early years, it was one of the only places for anthropologists to publish their, their work in a relatively high profile uh, place, the Viking Fund publications in the early years were given out entirely free of charge. Now, when Fehosh uh, re re returned to, to New York, uh, he returned with the foundation. The foundation was actually established on Valentine's Day in 1941. Now, unfortunately, the Second World War came along, and not much happened during those w war years. Uh, a, a lot of the money went to support the war effort. Fehos spent some time lect lecturing in Stanford. Where the foundation really got started was uh, 1945, 1946, at the at end of the war. Now, Venegren bought this mansion house for the foundation. It's located on 71st Street, uh, which uh, the big white square in the middle of Central Park there is the Museum of Modern Art, or excuse me, the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And uh, 71st Street is right, right in there. So the foundation was right in the center of things. It became almost instantly a center for anthropological work in the Northeast area of the, the United States, and also increasingly internationally. There were nine laboratories in this house. There was a library of 28,000 volumes. There were off, uh, offices for you know, visiting anthropologists to come. Uh, the foundation instituted uh, supper conferences. And we have a, a few of, we have recordings of 115 of these. Four of them are, we are streaming on the web right now and we have plans to put them all up. Right now you can hear Ruth Benedict, Raymond Firth, LSV Leakey, and Teilhard de, de Chardin. Now, the foundation also prided itself for funding research that was innovative and research nobody else would fund. Uh, in the 40s, we funded Willard Libby to develop carbon-14 dating. Now, no one would touch him at the time because it was too experimental. Uh, I was reading a history of this, and the historian was saying, oh, he got a grant for $5,000. According to our records, we paid him $35,000, which was about a quarter of a million US dollars in today's money. So we really put a lot behind this very exper experimental blue skies research. And Libby got the Nobel Prize for this in 1960. Now, also, uh, biological anthropologists among you. Uh, Sherwood Washburn, who was uh, one of the best known biological anthropologists uh, throughout the last part of the last century, uh, ran a series of foundation-supported summer schools that were responsible for introducing the new synthesis into biological anthropology. This is a time when a lot of genetic work was uh, coming out, evolutionary theory, and it was these summer seminars in the 1940s that really launched a whole new generation of uh, biological anthropologists. Uh, we also gave the Viking Fund Medal. Now, this was the US version of the Huxley Medal. 
And you notice the four years here that I just pu pulled off our website. It looks pretty uniform in terms of old gray men. Uh, the Viking Fund was given every year in cultural anthropology, archaeology, and physical anthropology. And there's only two women who were awarded the Viking Fund up to 1961. One was Margaret Mead, one was Mildred Trot Trotter, who was a very well-known biological anthropologist. And if you look, look around this audience, things have really changed since this time. Now, if you're wondering about our logo and the Viking Fund Medal, it was designed by M Miguel Corvarubias, who was a very well-known Mexican archaeologist. And in fact, I particularly like his self-portrait there with the Olmec head behind it and his own little mouth as the Olmec mouth. Uh, he uh, excavated the site of Teltilco in, in the Valley of Mexico, which is extremely well-known for uh, these uh, very uh, uh, unusual and evocative uh, figurines. Now, uh, throughout, again, this short period in the late 1940s, the foundation supported uh, research at Teotihuacan. Uh, Tepeshpan Man, for a long time, was the earliest recognized uh, human in the New World. And unfortunately, it's been shown now to be much more recent in time, but it even hit the cover of Time magazine. Now, at the Tepeshpan excavations, they used geophysics. This was what, one of the first examples of using geophysics in archaeology, where you basically x-ray the deposits to find the material. Again, Venegren was extremely interested in this because of his interest in technology. Now, in, those, uh, in, the 19, in 1940 to 1950, uh, the foundation put $175,000 into Mexican research alone. And this, again, is about 1.7 million today. And we think this is probably because of Venegren's interest in Mexico. And of course, uh, during this time, he uh, was living almost full time there. As a paleoanthropologist, I have to tell you about human evolution. Uh, the foundation supported a lot of work in the French uh, Upper Paleolithic caves. Franz Weidenreich and Ralph von Koenigswald, anyone who's had an introductory course in human evolution, knows von, uh, uh, Weidenreich uh, was the discoverer of Peking Man, ran the excavations there for a number of years. Von Koenigswald with Java Man. Von Koenigswald spent the war in a prisoner of war camp. Uh, the foundation brought him to New York in these post-war years to work with um, Weidenreich. F. Clark Howell got one of our first student grants. It was $1,500 and that's about equivalent with inflation to the money that we give students today. We uh, had the Early Man in Africa program, also had the American Institute of Human Paleontology, and I want to say one quick thing about this, because the way I learned about the foundation was through the casts, the models of the hominids that the foundation uh, produced. And uh, from uh, 1968 to 1976, the foundation produced 16,000 replicas like this and distributed them uh, around the, the world. And this was the only place you could go if you wanted to put together a teaching collection. And it came off of the foundation support for plastic research and casting research. Okay, now this graphic is one of the best ones I've been able to put together, showing the change in our field over this time. The, the decade I've been talking about is that down here between 1940 and 1950. This graph shows the number of doctorates given by US institutions in anthropology. And you can just see that the field is very much different at this point than it is today. Now, I realize this is US focused. I couldn't find international statistics. But if you put your experience in your own country on top of this, you can see how the field has exploded. Uh, Elizabeth Colson, who is a social anthropologist from UC Berkeley, wrote a very nice history of the foundation in relation to social and, uh, and cultural anthropology for our 50th anniversary in 1991. And what she was saying in this was that during this period, funding really wasn't that much of a problem. 
the U.S. Department of the Navy was funding re research in the Pacific. Uh, a lot of the countries with uh, colonial or ex-colonial experiences were funding research. And this was a particular crisis for the foundation, particularly when the U.S. National Institutes of Health uh, began funding seriously in biological anthropology and the National Science Foundations established a social science research. The big question at this point is what should the foundation do? Now, what happened in 1952? Uh, we, the foundation convened a symposium on anthropology that uh, convened 80 anthropologists at the time. And if you look at the caption on these pictures, you'll see some of the very well-known people there. What the purpose of this was to assess the state of anthropology in 1952 and decide how the foundation could help the field move forward. There was a very famous uh, Anthropology Today volume that was edited by Krober that was put out. There was a directory of anthropologists and one yearbook that come at, came out in 1955. The whole question was very similar to what we're going through today with the IUAS and the WCAA, is how can we best serve the international field and help the whole field move, to move forward? And uh, the, 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 this is where sole tax comes back into the picture. Because the problem was, the first idea was to put out a lot of volumes uh, you know, ed, uh, edited vol volumes, maybe yearbooks. The problem was they couldn't really get this out fast enough to reflect how rapidly the field was changing. In 1957 and 1958, the foundation set sole tax around the world to talk with anthropologists. He visited 650 anthropologists on every continent but uh, Australia. And the result of that was current anthropology. Now, those of you particularly our younger colleagues don't realize that current anthropology was the internet of the early 1960s. It was the anthropological internet. This is where the commentaries, where you publish an article, the discussion is published along with the article. You also might not realize that these early issues all had tear out letters in them. So you could communicate directly with um, Soltax and have ongoing discussions. Now, this was all done without the, the benefit of electronic uh, communication. Uh, we're trying to keep up the innovative nature of current anthropology. Uh, the, in, in 2000, current anthropology was the first anthropology journal that had electronic supplements. So you can publish with your article videos, audio files, extensive data files, wh whatever is appropriate. In recent years, we're putting out two issues a year that are totally open access. Uh, th these are issues that come off of our symposium meetings. There's also a lot of open access content in, in the main journal. And I was extremely pleased uh, on Friday, just this last Friday, to learn that Google Scholar has ranked current anthropology number three among all anthropology journals in terms of access. The top two are both biological journals, Journal of Human Evolution and American Journal of Physical Anthropology. Now, current anthropology wasn't the only move of the foundation into networking. The other innovation at this time was Berg Vortenstein Castle. Berg Vortenstein Castle was the foundation's European headquarters from uh, 1958 until 1980. Venner paid $35,000 to buy Berg Vortenstein Castle. And it apparently took about 300,000 to get, get it into a livable condition. Uh, but uh, Venner Gren mandated uh, Fehoch to find a place that would be pleasantly situated with a scenic background. He said the misfortune in this modern industrial age is that meditation is, slow, is slowly disappearing from our uh, civilization. Uh, the place uh, for which you should look also must have dignity and must uh, stimulate interest in historical cultures. Now, uh, be beginning in 1959, the foundation ran 60, excuse me, 86 culture, uh, meetings at Berg Vortenstein. The whole foundation staff would move from New York to Austria to run these meetings. 
and would play host to cycles of meetings and conferences coming through Berg Vortenstein. What, what one of the earliest was organized by Raymond Firth. A decade later, here's the physical anthropology one on uh, the uh, morphology of the primates. A decade later, here's one on uh, women and uh, the sexual division of labor. In fact, you'll notice this was our first and only conference that had an all-lady list of participants. And we, we actually, in these conferences, look for diversity of voice in anthropology. Now, I, I can't go through Berg Vorstenstein without again mentioning my own field of human evolution. In this conference, if you know anything about human evolution, the rather jaunty guy laying down in the front is Desmond Clark, who was a very high-profile Paleolithic archaeologist. The woman with her clutching her knees is Mary Leakey. The guy next to him is David Pilbeam, Ofer Bar Yosef, Glenn Isaac, Leslie Friedman. The, the woman sitting on the knee there is Lita Osmondson. She was Paul Fehosh's fifth wife. This was also a comparison with Indiana Jones. And when he died in 1961, she ran the foundation for another 25 years and was particularly noted for her management of these conferences. Uh, there was a whole series of human evolution conferences that had become classics in the field. And I couldn't resist just bringing in the covers of some of these books because these were what, were what inspired me when I was a student in human evolution. Okay, coming, coming back to our rapid change. Here, uh, again, where I've outlined in black are the castle years. If you think of the 1960s, you had the space race. Uh, you had the Cold War escalating with the Berlin Wall. You had the student protest movements. In the States, you had all of the civil rights. You had the women's movement during this time. You had decolonialization internationally that was proceeding extremely rapidly. And again, coming back to some of the insights of Elizabeth Coulson, she frankly says anthropology was having an identity crisis here. Because while all of this was happening, uh, other social sciences were moving into the traditional area that anthropologists study. And anthropologists, in a way, began to lose their focus on what their real um, su subjects were and how, what their unique contribution to anthropology was. But she also says here in uh, the Berg Vortenstein conferences that this was a, a very safe environment for anthropologists from around the world to meet, and particularly those from the Eastern Bloc. And the conferences kept uh, a lot of scholarly communication going on through these years. Now, uh, this was a particularly a time of turmoil for the foundation, because uh, if you look here, um, at what was happening with the stock market. And th this is a trace of the Dow Jones averages. You have the decade high there in January of 1973 and the decade low two years later. Now think of the foundation, we don't fundraise. We live entirely off of our, our endowment. And this was a huge problem for us, particularly when we had some very high cost items. Now, uh, this particular chart I, is one of my favorites. This is in 1968 dollars. Uh, you start out at what the foundation had traditionally thought would be its richest years, its highest funding years. Then the crash comes. There was a whole decade where the foundation was in crisis. And this particular man, Frank Wadsworth, saved the foundation for the field. And this is why we call our International Fellowship Program the Wadsworth Fellowships, because this person made the decision not to spend the foundation out of existence at this period, but to try to save it. And what he did was uh, say, okay, we're gonna divest ourselves of all of our big ticket items, our expensive items. The house in New York went, the castle went, and the casting program was closed. So the, these decisions were all made during the, those trough years. And what positively happened then is the foundation went to Wall Street. Half of our board of uh, trustees 
are Wall Street financial professionals. And they manage the endowment for us, for fun. And uh, they, some of them are interested in anthropology, some of them aren't so interested, but just enjoy playing with money. But they very aggressively use their skills for us to ensure that we have money to continue to support the field. Now, the second thing that happened at this time was uh, Lita Osmondson retired. And for 40 years, remember, the foundation had been run basically by the same family and brought in Sidel uh, Silverman as president of the foundation. And Sidel decided to use the shotgun approach. A lot of small grants, and the reason for this is that if there's a crash, we can cut back on our success rate very quickly. And this is what happened a few years ago during the crash. I was able to manage our outgo almost in real time as the market crashed. Okay, now if, if we come back here, you see the red line, we've regained our spending power of 1968. But again, look at it in relation to that red chart. Because in 1968, the field, both in the US and internationally, was much, much smaller. So that money went a lot further to a lot more anthropologists. Our big challenge today is to use that money to support the much larger, much more diverse field in the best way we possibly can. And this is why I'm here, and I want all of the input from you on how we can move the foundation forward. And just out of interest, that big bump going up was the bubble leading up to the crash in 2008. And you can see the crash again we had. We lost about a third of our endowment during the, that crash, and it's, it's come back up. We're, we're doing OK. OK, what is the foundation doing today? Uh, I sort of kept counted up and went through our records. If you go back to 1988, when Sidel Silverman came on and really formed the modern foundation, we've given away $75 million. Corrected for inflation, that's about 100 million US dollars. The blue part of the pie there are, is our money to doctoral students. It makes up by far the majority, 43% of what we do. Uh, the red pie is the money that goes to established or senior scholars, and that's about 20%. We have international collaborative grants, and that's about 5%. Our Hunt postdoctoral fellowships actually buy people out, young scholars within 10 years of their PhDs, to write their first book or write their first series of papers to get that job or to get established a promotion, tenure, whatever it might be. We also have conference and workshop grants, about 9%, and 15% go to our Wadsworth Fellows. And this is money that allows students from developing world uh, countries to get a doctorate in anthropology, an international level doctorate, anywhere in the world that they can achieve that. And we, we have fellows now throughout Europe, in U the US, in Mexico, and a, a lot in South Africa at Cape Town or Vitz. Okay, now in terms of actual number of grants, we've given out almost 5,000 uh, grants in the last 25 years. It averages about 200 a year. And in fact, because of the time span and all, we're, we're giving out now about 250 grants a year. And in terms of numbers of grants, about half of them go, go, go to the students. Okay, citizenship. We've given out grants to citizens of 118 countries who are working in 89 countries. And I was actually quite surprised by the subdisciplinary split about 60% of the grants go to social cultural anthropology. And this hasn't changed in the last 25 years. The field has been fairly stable, at least from our perspective on it. About 20% go to archaeology, about 15% to biological anthropology. I should say we award in rough percentage to the grants we get in. And if you don't give me an application, I can't give you money. So, you know, just. Keep that in, in your mind. Okay, so, so it's Adele Silverman. She was responsible for saving the foundation. She introduced this, um, the small grants and all. She also saved the conference program. And uh, th this particular building is uh, in Portugal, and it's almost become the new 
Burg-Wortenstein. Uh, it's one of our most popular venues for recreating the castle atmosphere, cloistering you to think great thoughts. We still run uh, two symposia each year. Uh, on the website, we have two application deadlines for this. I want you to send me your good ideas for the symposia. Once we accept the, your idea, we take care of all of the organization, we pay for it entirely, and all you have to do is put in the intellectual effort to make success out of it. We're looking for big questions in anthropology, and we're, we're looking for questions that are really going to begin to move the field forward. Now, uh, our uh, publications are published now as open access issues of current anthropology, and I've put in the World Anthropologies book because we emphasize international voices. The best way not to be accepted with a conference proposal is to have your participants all come from one country and not have this international communication that we feel is so important for moving our field forward. Okay, so, so Dal Silverman actually kick-started EASA. Uh, at this time, 20 years ago, we also provided funds to start the Pan-African um, Anthropological Association. Uh, she also started COPAR. She was very concerned about what happens to unpublished anthropological work. And you should really keep this in mind because if you die and your unpublished work dies, all of that knowledge goes. So you can come to, to, to the foundation for funds to help archive your unpublished material. And we work with you with, uh, with this to uh, locate a appropriate archive and this type of thing. Okay, now uh, Sedell retired in 2000. Dick Fox was the next president. He was particularly concerned about the bubbles of PhDs being produced in anthropology and what happens to all these young people. He revived the Hunt Postdoctoral Fellowship, which as I said is the fellowship that would pay you, will buy you out for a year to write your first book and to really get your, letters on, your um, leg on the ladder. Now, he was also the president during 9-11, and this affected him considerably, as it did uh, most New Yorkers. And he became very interested in engaged anthropology, practical anthropology, public anthropology, and ran a number of conferences and meetings uh, in this area, and this is something that we re really need to pay attention to. Now, I've been president since 2005, and I've been particularly interested in how we can really enliven the foundation to serve this growing population of anthropologists that has become so, so diverse and doing so many exciting things. Uh, the first thing I did was look, look at the website. And we try to run a very active website. I've got a young guy who I think is 22 or 23 years old who has a master's degree in anthropology from the New School who runs our Twitter feed. So we have a young voice in there. He trolls the web for everything interesting happening in anthropology. And of course, uh, publicizes foundation uh, grantees and foundation advance. But do ha ha have a look at our Twitter feed because he tries to pick up what really is going on in uh, the field. We, we also have quite an active blog post. I've tried to make the website as clear and friendly as possible. There's even a blog that tells you how to write a grant proposal. And I keep telling people to believe it because I wrote it and I'm the one that make the makes the decisions. <laughs> okay. Um, what, one, one of the things we've done also recently for international anthropology is developed an institutional development grant. And this provides 125,000 US dollars to anthropology departments in the, the global south. And right now you can see we're supporting Mongolia, uh, in, uh, Argentina, Nepal, the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, and most recently, the Social Anthropology Department at uh, Addis Ababa. Uh, this program developed out of a long-standing support for South Africa and trying to provide an entry for Africans into academic anthropology in South Africa. It became, uh, I, I, I couldn't uh, continue to privilege South Africa. So we've broadened, yes, Muggsy's shedding, shedding tears over here. 
but uh, th this is, uh, there's a huge need for this. And there's some very exciting development things going on. We have one application deadline for this uh, each year. Now, uh, I also want to talk about a new program we have called Engaged Anthropology. And that this has already come up in some discussions we've been having at the meeting. But it's very important for us to engage with our research participants and our stakeholders uh, in our research. And th this particular program gives money to our grantees, you have to have already had a grant from us in order to apply for this, to return to your field uh, area and share the results of your research in the most appropriate manner. We don't tell you how, how to do this. I, in some cases, it might be to engage with the scholars in your country of research. In some cases, particularly with archaeologists, they want to put up small museum displays or whatever to share the results of their archaeology. And the final reports for this grant are blog postings. And you, you can see that th this is our most recent blog posting from one of our engaged anthropology grantees. And this, po this program has become extremely popular, and we think it is very important uh, in the field today. Now, I also, as one of my last points, uh, want to announce a whole new grant program we have. And th th this is the first time I've actually mentioned this in public. And this is the Fejos Postdoctoral, Postdoctoral Fellowship in Ethnographic Film or Visual Anthropology. Because the, uh, over the 70 plus years of the Foundation's history, we have never honored Fejos's role. And frankly, if it wasn't for him and the tiger, we, we wouldn't really exist. And what we uh, are going to do with this is provide money very similar to our Hunt Fellowship for writing for young anthropologists to have money to produce uh, ethnographic film based on their, uh, their, the, the research that they've already undertaken. This isn't for film documentary. You have to have a doctorate in the field to apply for this, and it's to present the results of your research. We're also looking for new media interaction with this. And I particularly want to talk to a lot of you whose interests are in visual anthropology about how we might fine tune this program. We have the script of it almost ready, but we, we want to make sure it's right. Uh, the first deadline for this will be in May next year. And that this is also leading up to our 75th uh, anniversary, which is in 2016. And the reason we're launching this now is we want to have some products and films so we can showcase this for the 75th uh, anniversary. Uh, we're also uh, doing research into Fejos's ethnographic films. If they're as skillful and innovative as his commercial films, they'll really be a treat. And we're working again with the tri cri Criterion Collection in order to produce these, and we're hoping to uh, have some Fejos film festivals uh, during the uh, 75th uh, anniversary. Now, what I'm sort of leading up to with this is what you need to realize with Fender Grant is that we're responsible to nobody but us. Uh, this rather scared me when they hired me because I was talking to the chair of our board about sort of moving expenses and all of that. And he said, Leslie said, why are you doing this? He said, you are the foundation. And that was extremely scary. And what, what, what I have to do is to rely on you to help me move the foundation and continue to make it grow so we're serving the field in the best way we possibly can. Remembering that we have a limited of, uh, amount of money. Our Wall Street people are doing the best to, to make it grow. But under US law, we have to spend 4.5 of the, the capital each year. And if you add in inflation, which has been 2% over the last 20 years or so, we have to make a return on our endowment of about six and a half or seven percent just to stay in the same place. And so we have this precious resource, this vacuum cleaner money, that we can spend whatever way we want. And right now we're spending about five to six million dollars a year in support uh, of the field. So please help me, you know, continue to evolve our programs so it serves you the best we can. 
Okay. Now, uh, c c coming back here, we ha have our do doctorates awarded. What is the field going to be like? We have this huge expansion in numbers, and again, if you put in the experience from, from your countries on top of this, we, we know things are uh, r really growing rapidly in Latin America. There's huge interest in Eastern Europe. This shake up the social sciences was a uh, op-ed or an opinion piece that appeared in the New York Times about a week and a half ago. What they're saying here is that we're fossilized, that all of the social sciences are still living as if we were living uh, 100 y years ago. The point they're making in this uh, article is that the natural sci sciences have more or less evolved with the times. Uh, we've come into developmental biology and cell biology and a lot of the traditional zoology, biology, uh, physiology departments have disappeared. What they're saying in this article is what are we going to do about that? Are we going to just sit back and describe the same things in the same way uh, uh, again and again? Uh, what they're saying in this article is that we're getting to the point of diminishing returns and we need to make a jump and to re-enliven the, 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 the discipline. I mean, uh, they're, they're talking about sort of forming departments, so what do they say, biosocial sciences, network sciences, computational social sciences, behavioral genetics. Now, a, a, a lot of you have sour faces with this. And I'm not saying to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we don't want to lag behind. We want to best serve our, our, our discipline and use a lot of the new approaches that are um, maybe becoming available to help our understanding of the human condition. The panel that, that we're going to have on human nature versus human history is one step in the right direction. And uh, the foundation is actually or or organizing one of our symposia next year uh, to try to bring together the humanistic and science part of the field not the rather stale, you know, biosocial anthropology, but to see what the new avenues are and the new ways that we might be able to move forward uh, in the uh, 21st century. Again, I want to talk to you about more ideas uh, in relation to this. So uh, please visit our blog. This is uh, a recent posting advertising this conference. Uh, th th this is our opportunity to talk to each other and really move things uh, forward. And it just leaves me to thank everybody at the foundation. Uh, our long list of board of tr trustees, in fact, we have a bigger board than we have foundation staff now. And as I said, half of those are working for us to make sure that the money is available. Uh, I also have an academic advisory council of senior international anthropologists who are the go-to people when I really want to brainstorm about uh, de developing programs and m moving the uh, foundation. And then also to our staff. And we can't forget Fehosh and Vinogran, who actually gave us this beautiful resource we have. So I'll look forward to talking to you. Don't be shy about c coming up to me, because I'd really like to hear your input. Uh, thank you very much, and thank to John, and uh, thank you, IUAS. Okay, we have a little time for questions. Bettina Brown from oh, the University. Oh. Bettina Brown from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, actually in the discipline of political science. Uh -huh. However, there's lots of transdisciplinary stuff going on. Quick question, does one have to be designated as an anthropologist to, to apply? Uh, the quick question is no. Okay. But what we do look for is that you have to engage the anthropological li literature. And we have a killer question on the application form saying how does your proposal, your research, uh, forward theoretical anthropology. And, you know, we, we don't care where you come from, if you can convince us in that answer. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Uh, Hello. Yeah. I'm Jessica Simons from the University of Manchester. Um, 
My research field is um, actually Manchester itself. Um, and I've always presumed that because I'm doing ethnography in, if you like, a first world country, that I won't really be interesting to win a grant. I uh, wanted that be the case. Yeah, I'd, I, I wish I'd done the figures, but at least a third of the grants we support are for uh, urban anthropology. So we, we actually don't care. And uh, say, if, if you would ask us for subsistence living expenses while you're doing research in Manchester, we, we, we would pay for that. Uh, be, be, because we actually feel that you need to be free of worries about eating and paying your rent uh, and to, to, to give you the free freedom to do your research. So definitely, I, I mean, we will fund anthropological research in any context, in any country uh, in the world. Yeah, I'd actually like to see people from the Global South come and do research in Manchester as well. I think we get some interesting perspectives yeah. there. No, we, we, uh, I, I used to teach at Yale, and we had a Chinese student studying the Amish, which was a, fas fan a fascinating thing. Uh, yes, Seth. that the current anthropology was originally the journal of the IUAES, and now it's the journal of the Winter Grand Foundation in 1981. I wondered how that happened. That's not true. Okay. Uh, the uh, the uh, current anthropology was always a journal of uh, the Winter Grand. It was founded in 1959. Okay, and so it was never an in uh, the magazine? No. Uh, of IUAES, no. okay. And then, may I, ask, may I ask an informational question? Another more, is um, one, uh, one of the themes of the future of anthropology is to take the role of critical, of, of critical thinking, of mm. trying to question the, the everyday way we view the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, when, when one talks about the future of departments, uh, apropos of the article in the mm. New York Times, one wonders where a kind of crit a critical perspective will come in. And I wondered what your thoughts were on that, because it was a very uh, article really only about positivist um, anthropology, and I can see where that goes. But what happens to the more critical portion of it? Uh, th 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 this may be a, a conversation for the bar. Uh, but uh, what, uh, not, not, not necessarily addressing this, but one of the problems we have is that Many anthropologists today just think all we need to do is talk to each other. And I found as a biological anthropologist coming into the hotbed of social cultural anthropology, I had to learn a new language. And uh, it's, uh, I'm very happy with critique and all of this, but I'm also very happy when anthropology makes an impact. And this is one of the things that keeps our board of trustees going and our board of trustees behind us. They're interested in anthropology research appearing in the press, appearing on, on, on the TV, and in many cases, we don't do a good job of this at all. And I, I, I think this is what, what, what one of the things that we need to do in helping to raise the profile of anthropology as it exists now, and anthropology as we may move into the future. And I, uh, when I was, was in London, I, you know, thought, I think I, 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 I was on speed dial for ma many of the BBC jur journalists. And uh, that is extremely good that in the UK here, uh, anthropology seems to have a higher profile than it certainly does in New York. And uh, it's, it's something that we really need to move uh, to raise our profile internationally. And uh, we, we were talking with, at the IUAS meeting about how we might be able to facilitate this. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, here and then we'll come back to you. Hello. Yeah. Myself, I'm Professor Anjali Kurney. I've mm -hmm. come from uh, University of Pune, India. Uh -huh. Myself, I am urban anthropologist and development anthropologist. Uh -huh. I just want to know whether Veneran Grant provide grant for research project. And if it is yes, is it compulsory to have a collaborative pro project or if it is uh, okay if it is an independent project? Yes, uh, don't, don't be confused by this because we have two separate pro uh, programs. 
and you are entirely eligible to apply as an individual for our post-PhD research grant. Now, the second program we have is a collaborative research grant. So if you have a colleague in another country, we're, we're looking for really in the collaborative program, two people coming together from different backgrounds, from different t traditions, and doing a single body of research. And in that program, we also have a training aspect. So if you want to bring students, there's money to support students to, uh, to help you with the research or any type of training that might be appropriate. Okay, but is it uh, compulsory to have a collaboration with other university? No, if it, no. It's not? No, no, it, it, it's only for the institutional development grant. Yeah. Yeah, so if you wanted to apply for the institutional development grant, yes, we, 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 we do require a partnership because we find that it is really, it, it, it helps much better to be working in partnership uh, with a with with a, a, a university that, that might be able to help you in the goals you have. Okay. Yeah, we, we 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 can talk later yeah, about it sure, if you want. Sure. Sure. Thanks. Okay. There was a question in the back. Uh, my name is Amita Bhaviskar, and I work in Delhi in mm. India. And my question was also to do with training, because mm. I think the big difference that I see in the proposals that I evaluate mm. Mm. between students located in the Global South yeah. and those located abroad is in uh, not so much training for research as in just basic training in mm. terms of um, research methods, how to write proposals mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. So apart from your um, projects that, uh, that target particular departments, mm -hmm. um, you listed several. Mm -hmm. uh, does the Wenigren Foundation have any sort of um, you know, doctoral research training that happens in the form of workshops or any other kinds of um, you know, slightly longer yeah. term um, events? Yes, the, 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 this is a very good question. It's actually a very important question because uh, we, we find that the language isn't a problem. It's the research training that's the big problem. And right now, the only thing we've done is we have this blog on how, how to write a grant proposal. Uh, I'm thinking about doing some we we uh, webinars on writing grant proposals uh, that then would be uh, available. I'm, I'm also quite happy to be Skyped in to training courses. And I, I'm doing more and more of this. It's primarily in the US now, but there's no reason that we couldn't do this uh, internationally. So if you'd like me to talk to your course about grant writing skills, uh, that, that this could be, be arranged. Yeah. I would like to thank you very much for your nice deliberation. I have a question, very mm. small question. Mm. The last slide, which tells about the Board of Trustees, uh -huh. Academic Advisory Council, and Foundation staff. Yeah. I agree what you want to say. Why don't you extend your Wenner Grant Foundation in other continents and involve academicians? I don't see any Chinese, any Japanese, any Indian, any South African in the Board of Trustees. This should not be limited only to the Western world. Uh, it should be for the international world, anthropology for the world. Okay, uh, now th th this is structure, th this, is, this again is a ver very important question. And right now our reviewers, uh, we, I, I have a team of 60 people right now who review grant applications for us. We get 1,500 grant applications a year. Uh, about, 55% of those right now are outside the US. We have Latin America, we have uh, uh, India, and of course we're in, in Europe. Uh, the problem in terms of, of, of the Board of Trustees, the Board of Trustees is a governing board. Uh, they don't participate in the academic de de decisions. And I said half of them are Wall Street people that manage the endowment. The, there's two lawyers there that help us stay on the straight and narrow. And the, the, the rest of them are non-anthropological academics. And there's a very good financial reason for this that I, I, I can explain to you to later. The Academic Advisory Council. Uh, right now, we have uh, Eduardo Goes Nevis, who's from Brazil, uh, Shalini Renanera, who's uh, cur currently based in Switzerland, but of course is of uh, Indian training. 
and we have Nathan Schlanger, who's French. Uh, these people uh, sign on to serve uh, for four years, and they're required to come to New York t t twice a year. And uh, with, with this, uh, we are, are looking for the broadest the international re representation as we can. Uh, so uh, right now, th th this is what the structure is, and uh, we're you know, lo looking to move forward and being as inclusive as possible. Um, thank you for the really interesting um, uh, historical review to the history of the foundation. Mm. Uh, my name is Salah Sarala from the University of Oxford. Um, my question is regarding the, 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 the money that you have, that you mentioned, that is being handled by the Board of Trustees. Have you looked into what kinds of investments the foundation is investing into and are they ethical and green, if possible? Yeah. No, we, we, we have, uh, particularly in the last five or t to eight years, and we, we, we have an ethical review uh, every two years. And the, 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 this is a constant topic of, uh, of conversation. Uh, we, with this, and, and again, we, 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 we can talk in person with more details, but uh, ethical investment is extremely difficult. Uh, we currently have about 50 investment ma managers, and we're in funds of funds of funds of funds. And so it's vi very difficult to drill down into some of this. But we do try to keep as strong a close of eye as possible. And what our philosophy has been is that we feel that as we're trying to control, you know, that we aren't investing in unethical uh, areas. But because we can't check everything, what we're hoping is the outcome of this, uh, that the, the money is used to forward the, you know, the, the, the research and to um, uh, make contributions in that area. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh so, sorry. We're here first and then back there. Hello. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. I am Dr. V. K. Sharkar, West Bengal, India. I'm not a man of anthropology, but a man of history. Mm. But at the same time, I belong to a very, very unknown backward community of West Bengal. Mm -hmm. You see, there are more than 10 universities in West Bengal, India. Mm -hmm. Until now, no university has done any kind of research, even a little bit of research, even a single sentence on my unknown community, backward community in India. So I would like to know whether the present day anthropologists are confining their research within four walls, or they are trying to reach the people to whom to reach is very much easier. Uh, this is my humble question. Okay, well, I, I, I'm not sure that's a question for the foundation, but I think it's a question for everyone I in the audience here. So what, what I would recommend is that you network and you talk with your colleagues here and see if we can get something going. Okay, there, there was a question back in the back here. Oh, uh, oh okay, hold on, there, there, there's one up at the top. Uh, uh, Will you listen? Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, myself, Amlan Ray from Calcutta Spectrum Clinic and Endoscopy Research Institute. We have been working in the field of clinical anthropology for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. And this is not under the purview of the university. Mm -hmm. But we have understood there is a very, very strong bond between you people, Weiner Gain Foundation, and the rest of the world who are working under the purview of the university. But apart from that, the clinical anthropology and other anthropology, they have been working very well throughout the world, but we can talk about our own in Indian perspective. Mm -hmm. Do you have any provision to fund these particular expenses for the working for the reproductive health for the women of reproductive age between adolescence and the menopause? Mm. And there are the good number of work in, um, by the American anthropologists and the European anthropologists as well to work on the infertility and other related problems under the purview of the clinical anthropology. So we'd like to have an enlightenment to have any encouragement in terms of fund and in terms of response from Weinergan Foundation to do kind of research in Indian perspective. Thank you very much. Okay. No, uh, we, uh, as I said, we, we uh, will fund uh, uh, any topic in any country of the world. 
But where we are very concerned is that we fund research that will forward anthropology as a theoretical discipline. And we, we, we don't fund research if it's primarily applied in nature and or if it's primarily public health or medicine. And I've had a very difficult time during my time at Venegran defining what anthropology is. It has leaky edges. And uh, so uh, we, we perhaps c c can talk in private about your particular uh, si situation. But you have to remember we are a foundation that funds theoretical anthropology and at this stage not applied anthropology. And the reason that we've made this decision is one of finances that we simply don't have the resources to open it up to applied work. And there are ma ma many other funding sources for this type of research. Um, oh, okay. And, oh, okay. One last question. Okay, one last question. Uh, Tomoka Hamada Connolly. Uh, I really appreciate Winner Grant's uh, past and present support of IUAES. In this opening ceremony, we learned IUAS, after long, long labor, decided to reorganize mm. and then uh, now put the scientific commission's kind of forefront. Mm. And I'd like you to uh, tell us your idea about future collaboration with IUAES, because in the past, you gave IUAES always this wonderful mm. meeting venue. and. In, support uh, colleagues from developing countries. Mm -hmm. And now with a sort of newer idea of IUAES, including the name change maybe, uh, what is your idea of future relationship with Wendagrain and IUAES? Well, uh, I, I think that the short answer of that is as long as our missions are the same, we'll c c continue support. And uh, we, ha we have to look at each situation as it comes to make sure it's appropriate. Okay, what, what, last question. Yeah. Communication, we have seen, uh, has played a big role as an emerging technique in social or human evolution. Mm -hmm. Your presentation today, um, which uh, goes into, if I may, gel into the theme of this conference, gels into uh, organizational psychology. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is, uh, yeah, we would seek your uh, opinion on that or your understanding on that. Um, how do you view organizational psychology and uh, organizational communication as a part of uh, the evolution of the anthropological discipline? Uh, okay, I, I, again, this comes back to what is anthropology? And, you know, uh, my, t my talk about, br you know, uh, br bringing new techniques uh, into the field and all, it would be, you know, entirely appropriate to, to your comments. But right now, we're an anthropological funder. And to be successful with this, we need to be convinced that the multidisciplinary research is enriching anthropology. And anthropology is an enriching another field. So the, 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 this is something that you need to, to, to keep in mind. We're happy to fund new techniques that are helping us de develop. But we, we do get a number of applications from people wanting to introduce anthropology into other di disciplines. And right now, we aren't particularly interested in developing other disciplines. We're interested in developing anthropology. Well, Leslie, thank you okay. very, very much. Thank you.